the title. Welcome to Smash Fiction, the podcast where we pit two or more fictional characters against each other in a battle of strength or wits or the tireless defense of tiny creatures and see who would win. Oh, and I guess probably guns. They'll probably factor into this somehow. Anyway, <laughs> this week, John Wick versus Leon the Professional. The man known only as Ed sits calmly and patiently in the adequately lit basement of best quality vacuum repair. His appointment with the client isn't scheduled for another 15 minutes, but as he hears the sound of hurried footsteps descending the basement stairs, he quietly congratulates himself for correctly anticipating his client's schedule. After all, this man is known for being fast. Ed watches (laughs) as the client steps into the light. Skin the color of a perfectly toasted sesame seed bun. Eyes like two all-beef patties staring out from within a black domino mask. A black fedora, black pants, and bright red sneakers. Ed lets loose the slightest noise of disapproval when he sees that the client is still wearing the black and white striped shirt and loud red tie featuring a repeating pattern of hamburgers. After all the effort Ed went through two years earlier to set up this repeat felon with head reduction surgery, and he still insisted on giving himself away by wearing his trademark shirt and tie. At least he seemed to be exercising some sense and had thrown a black trench coat all over it. But there is something off about the client today. A kind of special sauce, if you will. (laughs) Difficult to identify, but impossible to miss. (laughs) Then Ed realizes it's fear. Regardless of the amount of trouble this client had found himself in previously, he was always sanguine, optimistic, reckless even. Even when the client's former employer had sent two superpowered mercenaries after him last year, he managed to stay one step ahead of them, laughing the whole time, until both mercenaries ended up being force-fed fast food as punishment for failing to catch him. But this is different. Very different. Something had spooked the Hamburglar. (laughs) The striped snatcher of sandwiches sits across from Ed. With no greeting or preamble, he says, I got a big problem, Robble. How quick can you get me out of the country? Ed maintains his stoic demeanor, never breaking eye contact. It pains me to say it, but that's impossible at this point. I'm afraid this time you've gone too far, as I suspect you're beginning to realize. The Hamburglar stands, pacing around the room manically. What the hell? The clown hasn't even increased the bounty on my head, but all of a sudden I start hearing that I got two crazy hitmen coming after me. What is the Roblin deal here? Ed carefully steeples his (laughs) fingers as he watches the Hamburglar's frantic zigzagged journey through the basement. I understand you stole a cheeseburger in New York City. The Hamburglar turns and gives Ed a look reserved only for the truly oblivious. Uh, newsflash, Eddie boy. I stole 289 burgers in my last trip through NYC alone, and I was only there for six hours. Might need to be more specific. (laughs) Ed's eye contact remains unbroken. You stole a burger from a middle-aged man sitting at Burger and Barrel on West Houston Street. Right, right, right. Medium rare, sweet onion and bacon jam, pickles, American cheese, special sauce, brioche bun. What's your point? That man was John Wick. (laughs) Who the robble is John Wick? John Wick is one of the two most feared assassins in the world. Until recently, he was retired. Then, last week, he lost his wife, his dog, his car, and his house, and he exacted bloody lethal revenge on all who were responsible. And then, after all that... He goes to Burger and Barrel, the restaurant he and his recently deceased wife consider to be their place, and got the one thing in the world which still had any meaning to him, his favorite cheeseburger. And you took it from his very hands. He is coming for you now, and he is very, very angry. You killed that cheeseburger from his hands. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, says the Hamburglar, finally stopping in his pacing. There's more, Ed says dolefully. On your way out of New York, you attracted the attention of the authorities and began to cut through an apartment building. While exiting the building via a window, you happened to knock a potted plant off of a window ledge. (laughs) Oh, shit. (laughs) The Hamburglar looks at him blankly, his memory for accidentally destroyed plants much worse than his memory for purposefully stolen hamburgers. (laughs) Ed continues, that plant belonged to the man known only as Leon. Do I want to know? Leon is the other of the two most feared assassins in the world. His days are spent almost exclusively in training. The only times he allows himself a fleeting moment of happiness away from his business of death dealing is in the care of his beloved potted plant, which I believe he has privately begun to refer to as Gene Kelly. 
and you knocked Gene Kelly from the windowsill into the sidewalk six stories down, effectively severing any ties that Leon might still have had to a sense of humanity. Oh, says the Hamburglar, his vision beginning to swim. He desperately lunges toward Ed, grabbing the man by his plaid lapels. You gotta help me, Robble. These two guys are coming for me. I'm dead meat, Robble, and I know dead meat. <laughs> Ed meticulously pries the Hamburglar's grasping fingers from his shirt, smoothing the wrinkles out as he speaks. There's only so much I can do for you at this point. Right now I can offer you a place to hole up, a sprawling mansion on the outskirts of the city, defended by a small army of well-armed guards and the best security systems money can buy. Robble, breathes a Hamburglar in almost reverent disbelief. Where'd you manage to get your hands on something like that? Ed thought back to one of his previous clients, North America's most notorious and powerful crime lord. Not long ago, he had approached Ed, explaining that he'd grown tired of his life of wealth and power and had decided to start over. Ed managed to secure him a new identity under the name of David Waters, and in exchange, the crime lord had left Ed his mansion and many guards. Ed had no need for such extravagancies himself, but it looks like it had come in handy now. Never mind where I got it, Ed says out loud. If you want it, it's yours. If not, you can take your chances on your own. Do you think it'll help, Robble? Oh, certainly not. I think you've burgled your last hamburger, my friend. At this point, I think the only question is, which unrealistically elite hitman will be able to sneak past the security systems, slaughter the mook guards, and defeat their rival in a vicious battle of guns and martial arts before they finally put a bullet between the eyes of the Hamburglar? I have no idea, and I do not envy whatever douchebag the Cosmos see fit to figure it out. Speaking of douchebags, I, Dan Mulcairin, will be your judge this week. <laughs> Sorry, no one thought that was that funny. <laughs> Advocating for John Wick are Kit Mulcairin. I'd like to make a dinner reservation for two. <laughs> and Colin Mulcairin. Oh, that John Wick. You mean I read all of Seventh Sea for nothing? <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. Advocating for Leon are Miles Schneiderman. It's when you really start to fear my presence that you learn to appreciate my absences. <laughs> and Megan Bob. Milk. It does a body count good. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And also, welcome back, Miles. It is uh, good Thank to you. have Miles. you back. Thank you. It, uh, you. You seem to have enjoyed yourself uh, during your absence. Yeah, I did. For some reason, some really cool stuff happened. So, you know. Excellent. Um, <laughs> taking this ring off my finger, though, it just won't fucking come off. I don't yeah. <laughs> I think maybe it's cursed. <laughs> uh, happens be. to the best of us. <laughs> I, I keep haunting Dan. That's right. I just go, Ooh, and he's trying to sleep. <laughs> oh, I thought you just gave him like a negative, permanent negative plus one to his willpower save. I mean, that too. <laughs> In order to determine who goes first this week, I made an elaborate show of developing a completely new randomization algorithm, as novel as it was fair. In truth, I just looked at the win-loss record for this season and saw that not only were Kit and Colin in the lead, but they were specifically ahead of me, and that will not stand. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, due to the, uh, completely random algorithm that I totally used for this, Team Leon will be going first, followed by Team John Wick, who I'm pretty sure are cheating, or at least using some sort of performance-enhancing chemicals. <laughs> <laughs> Team Leon, I don't have time for this Mickey Mouse bullshit. John Wick is fundamentally the wrong person for this job. He is a walk in the front door, fight hand to hand, do cool tricks, attract the police, everyone knows my name kind of killer. Those are risky tactics that needlessly complicate what is a very simple mission. Do you need to fight every single person or destroy everything on your way in and out? No, showboating is a waste of time and leaves him open to injury. He's not afraid to get his hands dirty and scuffle around, but you do take damage doing that. And the more damage you take, the harder it is to finish the job. And John Wick spends a fucking load of time getting injured. Like, have you seen the movie poster? The advertisement is essentially, come watch this dude acquire preventable injuries. <laughs> also, watch him pay for goods and services with gold doubloons and visit posh hotels. Much is made of John Wick's feat of killing three people with a pencil. People hear that and go, ooh, so good at killing. No. What that is, is a man that showed up unprepared and made do with a pencil. A man who thought it the fuck through might have brought a proper weapon with him, or at least carried a knife like a sane person. But no, little Johnny showed up unprepared. Cool story, bro, but next time maybe plan ahead, like a professional. That's not the name of the thing. <laughs> 
None of this amateur hour tomfoolery with Leon. Did you see his Rob Liefeld body harness of weapons? That's how prepared he is. He has custom weapons harnesses and he carries fucking grenades with him. You know, for reasons. And yes, <laughs> Leon absolutely can improvise as he does at the end of the film by hiding in the fucking ceiling and dropping down like a gymnast to kill mooks while upside down. Dealing with surprise is in his remit, but he handles it with precision and tactical decision making. Take people out, barricade, get Matilda to safety, infiltrate the ranks, finish the job. Logical and prepared. Jonathan has a great deal of weapons proficiency and hitting people with cars abilities, but the number of weapons you can use is only as good as your ability to meet your goal and how far you'll go to get it. John Wick will go far, and he will use a lot of stuff at his disposal. He uses guns and pointy things in cars. Leon uses guns, garrots, heights, grenades, and his own fucking death. John Wick doesn't have it in him to go that far. Most people don't, but Leon does. For some people, their life flashes before their eyes on the point of death, but for Leon, that moment is a chance to take out someone else on his shit list. Will Wiki go that far? Methinks not. <laughs> He'll run to ground and hang out with Lawrence Fishburne and his gang of pigeon lads. <laughs> Leon can get to the safe house, crawl through the vents, and cut out security feeds as he does in the opening of The Professional. Or disguise himself as one of the mooks, like he disguised himself as a policeman at the end of the film. As we see in the opening of the film, Leon clearly does recon before he goes in and is a master tactician. He knows where the vents go. He knows how the security system operates. He knows how to lure people where he wants them to be and separate a group, leaving his target vulnerable. And apparently he moves silently and without warning because that guy is in the stairwell, in the vents, on the balcony, and then in the hallway within two minutes. But really... There's an even better way for Leon to take out Hamburglar. There's a massive advantage that Leon has over John, and it's that everyone and their mom knows who John Wick is in the John Wick films. In which case, Leon knows about him. Nobody knows who the fuck Leon is, though. He's just a weird plant-washing loner. Leon can take advantage of Wick's tactics, wait for John Wick to distract all the mooks. When he walks in the door, guns blazing, if there's one thing that we know happens in John Wick films, it's that everyone swarms him and wants to take a bite. Leon can use the distraction to take out the Hamburglar and escape while John Wick is still doing his daily dose of flip kicks. Leon's comfortable with using distractions, like he uses Matilda to lure people into opening their doors. John Wick is just a much more dangerous and loud Matilda. <laughs> Within Smash Fiction continuity, the Hamburglar has already escaped the clutches of two different reckless tank characters, Dante, Sparta, and Deadpool. If anything, this thieving Dilf is prepared for this style of attack. <laughs> Maybe not by someone as well-dressed, but ultimately the same style. Leon is something the Hamburglar won't have seen before has probably never heard of, and definitely can't get intel on. Leon doesn't know what Facebook is, and if he did, his only friends would be Tony and his plan. John Wick is kind of the ideal distraction, and he's super into MMA with guns, so the mooks will keep him busy, while Leon sneaks in and snuffs Hamburger quietly, and then goes back home, drinks a glass of milk, and sits in the dark, because gosh darn it, he's earned it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll bet that plant isn't even, like, a profile. It's just a page. You know, you can like it. <laughs> Leon's plant. In both of his films, John Wick is described as a man of focus, commitment, sheer will. In neither film is John Wick described as a man of intelligence, tactics, sneakiness, cunning, or self-reliance. And there's a very good reason for that. Wick might be really good at shooting people at bizarrely close range, but he's also more conspicuous than Keanu Reeves' face trying to portray subtle emotions, worse at making good choices than post-Matrix Lawrence Fishburne, and as actively, intensely stupid as the plot of John Wick 2. <laughs> When a bunch of dudes who are already terrified of him try to solve their problems by sending progressively more goons at him, Wick does fine. But when time is of the essence, and he's up against a smart, tactically-minded stealth bunny like Leon, sorry, stealth pig, stealth pig, pigs are better. <laughs> no, I like stealth bunny. Dude is gonna need a bigger pacifist hotel. The story of John Wick's complete and total idiocy begins before any of the movies, when he first got out of The Life by completing a supposedly impossible task. Of course, we learned later that he had help for that, the same way he has help for everything, but we'll get to that uh, later on. First, I want to ask you guys a question. Let's say you're an ultra-badass, legendary hitman who just retired against the wishes of your employer. You're leaving behind an unbelievably massive and extensive criminal infrastructure in which you have ties to literally everyone. An intricate web of alliance and betrayal. 
The only way to escape was to do something believed to be impossible, which you did, but everyone knows you will eventually be drawn back in. So, here you are, in your beautiful burglar magnet mansion, waiting for someone from your old life to decide it's not that easy to leave after all, or at the very least for some ironborn asshole to, I don't know, <laughs> break into your house, beat the shit out of you, and kill your dog. At what point do you decide it's a great idea to conceal your small arsenal of firearms not in a locked cabinet, not in a chest in the attic, but buried underneath your concrete floor where they are inaccessible except by sledgehammer? The legendary Baba Yaga, well, the second most legendary Baba Yaga, <laughs> gets even more stupid in John Wick 2 when Santino comes to him and calls in an old favor. We've all seen this movie, right? You don't get out of the old calling in an old favor trick. Yet Wick tries, insisting he's retired, even though he said the words, I'm thinking I'm back, at the end of the first film, and refusing to take the marker that he signed in blood. And then he gets all surprised when Santino burns his house down. Even the other characters in the movie are like, dude, what did you expect? Although I have to say, the more of John Wick 2 I watched, the more convinced I was that the only reason anyone in Wick's universe fears this guy is because they're all even dumber than he is. He and Cassian literally shoot at each other in the middle of a crowd and nobody notices. And on his so-called suicide mission to kill Gianna D'Antonio, Wick accomplishes the mighty feat of walking into a party and then walking into Gianna's room after she sends her bodyguard away for no apparent reason and then watching her slit her own wrists. That's a hell of a resume booster, John. Compare all this to the way Leon operates. Dropping down from the ceiling, hiding in the shadows, using a for God's sake sniper rifle to shoot people from a distance the way, you know, a hitman does. Leon's tactics are impeccable. He takes a hostage at one point, drags him out of sight, and fires his gun into the air, drawing the rest of his enemies inside to kill their own teammate in a hail of gunfire. He has made an entire life of being unseen. Whether that means waiting to open the rifle scope until the last minute to avoid metal glare, wearing clothes no brighter than the floor, or just generally being so unremarkable that people don't notice or think about him. Everyone knows John Wick's name, and they get ready for war when they hear it. Nobody knows who Leon is, and they never see him coming. That's why Wick has to fight his way through 200 people over the course of his franchise, while Leon simply disguises himself and walks past 200 people in his. There are only two rules in John Wick's crime universe, and he ends up breaking them both because he's an idiot. The last one he breaks is the anti-bloodshed rule at the Continental, at which point he is excommunicated, totally cut off from the underworld network which allows him to do basically anything. It's how he gets his weapons, how he gets his information, how he gets medical treatment, how he gets the shit tons of ammo he needs so he can unnecessarily shoot people in, like, each of their limbs before killing them. Everything! Perkins would have killed him in the first movie if it weren't for his sniper buddy, and he would have died in the second movie if he didn't know the secret code of the pretending to be homeless. That safety net society and his status therein is the sole reason for his survival, and he is utterly crippled without it. Look at his face at the end of John Wick 2 when, cut off from the network and with a million dollar bounty on his head, he executes his cunning plan of running down a crowded street. <laughs> That's the best expression of sheer panic Keanu Reeves is capable of pulling off. Sure, Leon dies at the end of his film, but he goes out like a pro, sacrificing himself to kill the bad guy in a massive explosion. He lives up to his nickname. The Boogeyman was overhyped from the beginning, and now he's just over. Some expertly placed shots from Team Leon, well done. Team Wick, why are you looking at me that way, and what are you planning on doing with that pencil? <laughs> John Wick is like a horror movie monster if a horror movie monster discovered guns and martial arts were a thing. <laughs> Once you're his target, your days are numbered. And it's a single digit number. Don't get it twisted. Wick is not just a seasoned hitman and quite possibly an ex-marine judging by the tattoo on his back, but a legend in the upper echelons of the criminal world. When the mob leader Tarasov sent 14 hitmen to take Wick out, they are all rapidly murdered one by one as Wick moves through the dark house like death itself. And this was after being out the game for four years, as you might expect from his most excellent background. Ha <laughs> ha. He's able to both move through rooms and murder oh so quietly. While one of Yosef's bodyguards was shaving in a locker room, he completely missed that just a few feet away, Wick was silently putting another guard into the forever sleep. 
in the following club scene, Wick was murdering bodyguards left and right, and they knew he was coming. He uses handguns with an artful precision, only using the least necessary amount of shots to disable and kill opponents. My dude, while grappling with another assassin, reloaded a gun using only his left hand and his left knee. I could try that shit. <laughs> Speaking of- I could do it. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of, when fighting other specially skilled assassins, the fights sometimes go melee, but as we discover in chapter two, knives are the dessert of assassination. <laughs> and this boogeyman's got a sweet tooth. But whether it's with knives or unarmed, Wick uses his combined fighting style of Judo, Jiu-Jitsu, Aikido, and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu to grapple, flip, kick, and destroy. He has perfect situational awareness. Which cannot be taught. Thank you. <laughs> Hey. And, <laughs> and uses the environment to his advantage whenever possible. His most legendary melee stunt was killing three dudes in a bar with a pencil, and we get to actually see some sick pencil stunts in chapter two. He slammed that pencil through an eye, an ear, and two sides of a human neck, and guys, that pencil never broke. My dude killed two assassins with a pencil and could still take a standardized test. <laughs> He'd fail it. <laughs> 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 Glad we're resorting good. to uh, that level. <laughs> Are just, we civilized, Miles? Are I'm just we civilized? Go, gonna go ahead and put a uh, one in Miles's burn column for the night. <laughs> <laughs> we were a civilized kid. Then you killed my dog. <laughs> During his unarmed fight with Tarasov at the end of the first film, when the Russian mob boss cheats by pulling out a knife, Wick grapples with him briefly before allowing himself to be stabbed in order to keep Tarasov in place, then breaks the Russian's elbow. This gives Wick an immediate edge, no pun intended I swear, as he pulls the knife out of himself and stabs the stunned Tarasov into blessed peace. Easily overlooked of Wick's multitudes of badassery is his endurance. Besides surviving knife wounds, my dude falls a full story onto his back and quickly gets up to keep chasing his prey. He purposefully crashes a car into multiple other cars. No neck injuries! <laughs> he gets hit by a car in the leg and still takes out multiple dudes right afterwards as if he didn't just get hit by a goddamn car in the leg. <laughs> At the end of the first film, my dude uses a surgical staple gun on himself to close that knife wound from the fight with Tarasov. In chapter two, Wick fights like five other top-notch assassins trying to get the bounty on him in one night. Those Hamburglar bodyguards ain't gonna be shit. He takes a shot to the lower abdomen during the first of these fights, but continues kicking ass and taking everybody's names right on through the pain. If his ability to shrug off pain simply comes from adrenaline, then he's got adrenaline for days. And let's not forget that in the first few scenes of the first movie, we see him feed milk and cereal to a puppy, which he then takes out for a car ride. This is a man who willingly subjected himself to being hotboxed with dog farts, and yet he still wins. I can say that with a straight face. <laughs> Truly godlike endurance. <laughs> Why are you kink shaming him? <laughs> <laughs> oh no, don't go there. John Wick is the assassin that you call to take out other assassins. Anybody who's anybody knows his name and what it means, to the point where even the cops know better than to interfere with his work. He's also got a slightly darker black turtleneck. <laughs> As Kit has established at this point, John Wick the movie is a ridiculous movie that makes no sense. And John Wick the character is a ridiculous man who similarly does things that make no sense. His speed and aim and reflexes and willpower are all superhuman. His fight scenes are like dances. He is a beautiful hurricane of destruction. Leon, on the other hand, is more like a, did someone leave a window open of destruction? Because I feel a bit of a breeze. <laughs> he's fine, but he's like a normal human being. He's like a somewhat realistic portrayal of a hitman by Hollywood standards. John Wick is a cartoon character, a parody of competence. Leon tells Matilda the rifle is the first weapon you learn how to use because it lets you keep your distance from the client. The closer you get to being a pro, the closer you can get to the client. The knife, for example, is the last thing you learn. Okay, so based on that basic philosophy of hitmanship as laid out by Leon, Leon relies on planning and stealth and running away and hiding whenever bullets start flying because, in a straight fight, he might get shot. He's probably about as fast and accurate with a gun as most of the thugs and DEA agents that he encounters, and so like in a big room where neither Leon nor his enemy have a drop on one another, they just both draw their guns and start shooting, it's gonna be like a coin flip for who wins and who loses. If Leon's outnumbered, his odds get even worse. So understandably, Leon sticks to the shadows. He doesn't usually ever willingly enter a fight unless he knows that his opponent is at a severe disadvantage. When Leon's home is getting invaded by DEA agents, he hides up in the ceiling and then drops down and shoots a bunch of them and takes out the first group of them no problem, because he has the element of 
of surprise. But then his time runs out and the element of surprise is used up and there's still one dude left over. Leon shoots the dude, but not before Leon gets shot in the shoulder. And after that, his eyes bug out and the next time he raises his gun, it starts shaking like Taylor Swift. There's a lot of montages in the John Wick movies of John Wick being a badass in a variety of circumstances over long periods of time. Not just the aforementioned one where he gets attacked by all of the world's top assassins in a single night and dispatches them all, but there's also the bit at the beginning of John Wick 2 where he's trying to find his car and he stealth kills a bunch of dudes in different circumstances. Sometimes the targets are alone, sometimes they have friends nearby, sometimes he uses a weapon, sometimes he uses bare hands. The closest thing to an equivalent montage of Leon at his most badass that we get is when he does his series of assassinations where he uses the same technique over and over again. Matilda knocks on the door, asking for help, they open the door, he breaks the security chain with bolt cutters and executes the target. Same way every time. The technique's not bad, especially because the people that Leon is going after are low-level criminals. It relies on the target being alone and unarmed and not expecting trouble. But the one time that things do not go Leon's way, when the target is armed and starts opening fire on him, it becomes a major issue, and he and Matilda almost get killed. Because as I said previously, one random untrained dude with a gun shooting at him is a threat to Leon in a way that it simply is not for John Wick. So Leon says the better of an assassin you are, the closer you can get to your target. The last thing you master is the knife. How many knife fights are there in John Wick? Uh, multiple ones in each movie. We see that John Wick is a master of the knife. And actually, Leon doesn't know, but the thing that you learn after that is the pencil. <laughs> <laughs> The one time that Leon tries to disguise himself as a DEA agent, the main villain Stansfield, who knows his face and is himself a DEA agent, recognizes Leon and starts tailing him. Leon doesn't hear him walking behind him, despite the fact that he is like a foot behind him. Stansfield shoots him in the back with a handgun at point-blank range. Leon never sees it coming. Looks like someone does not have perfect situational awareness. <laughs> that's well, okay. I mean, it can't be taught. Oh, that's a shame. I was gonna say, like, John Wick could teach you. But, but it can't. Because it can't be taught, but also because you're dead. Because you were bad at being an assassin. <laughs> also, they keep saying you're Italian in that movie, but stop it. You're clearly French. I don't know what this is all about, but you're Frencher than an Eiffel Tower made of baguettes, which is smoking a cigarette as it surrenders. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Wow, shots fired. Oh my god, you French. can't see it, but I'm standing up in my closet. <laughs> Well, oh, goodbye, French really fans. Yep. Goodbye, Bye. French fans. It was nice while we had you. <laughs> no, I love the French. They're so angry. Leave Nihilus. your cheese. We'll take that. Come back the to opinions of Colin family. are not the opinions of the rest of the Smash Weekend podcast. I understand that when you explain their plans, Leon's strategies sound better, like in the abstract. They sound more intelligent and more methodical, but you know what? They're slower and they end up being less effective than Wick's more direct approach. His over-reliance on planning and his little tricks is a crutch to make up for the fact that he is a normal human being who is bound by the laws of physics, and therefore not able to defeat a dozen men at once in a straight fight. He might eventually be able to make it into the complex and execute the target, but by the time he does, the only thing that the cleaner will have left to clean up are the bloodstains. And also the ketchup. I assume Hamburglar's bleed ketchup. <laughs> <laughs> Another greasy, unshaven performance from Team John Wick. Well done. <laughs> At this point, the guards are dead. The security systems have been evaded or disabled, so all that remains between you and your target is each other. We move now to rebuttals. Team Leon, fight for the rights of round sunglasses and suspenders everywhere. <laughs> So, okay, well, first thing is that you were talking about his fight with Terrazov. Like, that was really impressive. He's like 57 years old, and he's like a leathery, alcoholic 57. And Keanu John Reeves Wick is like 65, dude, down. come on. <laughs> no, he isn't, he's like early 50s. <laughs> But yes, I'm sure Vigo is Yeah, I'm just, I'm not impressed by his fight with, like, old dad figure and, like, that being difficult. Old dad figure's previous accomplishments include fucking sneak punching his son. <laughs> so I am not impressed. I, I wasn't like citing that as a like, oh my god, he defeated this totally ripped 60 year old. <laughs> yeah, if you want like, examples of him beating awesome people, we have so yeah, many others to choose I, I from. I was just but saying go. like his, his just endurance. It's weird that you talked about that. It's just like, no, I was, I was pointing out his endurance level is so fucking insane and his willingness to do insane things to get the edge. This dude cheats and pulls a knife in this like fight. And the only way to get out of his hands, oh. he was like, fine, let's do this. And he stabs himself, breaks that fucker's fucking elbow, takes his knife out of his chest, and ah, just murders him, murders him dead. The whole thing where, like, you talked about how 
he like when he actually gets into a straight fight, he can't handle his shit. There is the first scene in The Professional where there is a bunch of dudes with a bunch of guns and they know he's coming and they spread out looking for him. Some of them are on their own. Some of them are in the same room as the dude. We're seeing him there in that scene when he is like prepped and ready. The scene with the DEA invasion, he had like a second to get ready for those people. And there was a shit ton of them. In the first scene at the beginning of the film, he had time to prepare, which he has now. He knows the layout, which he has now. You know who he doesn't know is there? Fucking John Wick. Well, actually he does because somebody just said, oh my God, John Wick is coming. And then somebody else was like, hey, <laughs> you know who it is? It's John Wick. And somebody else was like, hey, whose cheeseburger did the hamburger steal? And someone else looked at him and was like, he stole John Wick's cheeseburger. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then you know the person what? goes, oh. oh yeah, the and then they goes, all oh. died and it didn't matter. <laughs> oh, you know what? The only time John Wick ever gets taken out is when someone takes him out via stealth. So I feel like if Leon even feels like John Wick's going to be a threat, he's just going to like take him out with a garrot wire or something and just they all do Ed, John Let's talk about how Leon got taken out by like non-stealth of walking up behind him in a hallway and shooting him in the back from point. Well, after. like oh, a supremely okay. right. traumatic. I have event. To that. The way that that is filmed, there is no sound because there has just been a massive explosion and his hearing is fucked to shit. There is no sound whenever you watch that clip. And it is from Leon's perspective. So the implication is that he does not fucking hear anything. He is so blown up that all he could do is walk. And then when that happens, he has that split second of going, shit, I'm shot. And then going, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to kill the motherfucker that shot me. Yeah, guess what? Leon was prepped for that situation. He was prepped for the fact that somebody might kill him because he had fucking grenades on him. I would like to point out in the scene before <laughs> that, too, he he is seen having a conversation with DEA agents. He's talking to them like, are you from the third precinct? And he's like nodding and he's talking to them about the mask stuff. So his hearing is not totally shot. He's able to like hold a conversation with them. Team John Wick, you, uh... Rebutting again? <laughs> I love, I love uh, Jimmy the uh, cop so much. Yeah, he's the best. <laughs> Such a I good NPC. I want his movie. <laughs> you mean, do, you, do you mean Jimmy the only cop? Is that who you're talking about? <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, it's Jimmy the only cop. Oh, hey, Jimmy. None of the you're other like, cops want to be around from John Wick's You're like, area. even the cops are afraid of him. It's like, yeah, the one. <laughs> right. They're, like, Jimmy's the one who keeps pulling the short straw, and he's like, fuck. <laughs> Check on John Wick's house now. Well, you know, they experimented together in college so they got <laughs> <laughs> can't go one episode and, 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 <laughs> anyway okay so you mentioned how like he's unprepared because he used a pencil to murder dude he was at a bar this seems to imply that some idiots were picking a fight with him when he was trying to relax with a bourbon for once just let a man relax with a bourbon for once no pencil in the ear he carries like as much as he feels like he needs any situation and not anymore because he can kill you with anything he actually doesn't carry anything unless he's going to do something at which point he spends like half an hour getting guns from some dude he doesn't have those dudes anymore he's excommunicated he has he's gonna guns. have his ways i'm pretty sure he still has his bulletproof suit yeah. and like all of his other shit like which is some crazy future stuff that like leon does not have again john wick is a stupid cartoon character that who makes no sense worn out, he has man. a bulletproof suit okay know, bulletproof say, suit why are there blood bullet, stains all over his clothes only good once <laughs> if he only takes what he needs how the fuck come he didn't take more stuff whenever he went to the bar that's his whole life is people going, hey, look, it's that fucking John Wick guy. He, he didn't kill him. need to. This is well, not him in a bar. This is him preparing. Ahead. And when we, when we can see what it actually looks like when he prepares. Like there was the time when um, he was going to the uh, D'Antonio residence and he actually scouted the place out and like cased it ahead of time and like figured out about all these catacombs and like found maps of the place and stashed a bunch of weapons in the catacombs underneath in like a whole bunch of places so that he could like pop down the catacombs and get new weapons when he needed him so that he would he could walk in through the front door as you said not looking conspicuous looking like he's just going to the party because he doesn't have any visible weapons on him because he's hit all of his weapons all over the place all the stuff you're talking about is because he made a phone call to the underground network of criminal shit which he can no longer do leon does everything himself he does not rely on all these people like, except for the times that he was lying on matilda but <laughs> well. i mean in the first movie john wick does everything by himself he only gets like a little bit of a assistance in the second movie because he was hired to do this big hit when his house gets blown 
up, he goes to a, a bank and he has a bunch of other weapons stored in a safety deposit box because he can't get access to the weapons below his house because his house got blown up. There's like always another plan and he's going to find some other person like you know one of his friends who's like willing to give him some weapons like you talked about he has this big support structure like um willem dafoe who was saving his butt in the first movie who was hired to kill him by the way his support structure is not going to be helping him out they're supposed to be turned against him they're probably all still going to help him because they like him because for some reason everybody likes him or or, willem dafoe's dead (laughs) okay yes screw will he always has another friend (laughs) all he has to do is go to staples and buy a pack of number twos and then everyone gonna die (laughs) (laughs) You said that, like, Leon needs to have Matilda there to help, like, as a comparison. Dude, John Wick will be Leon's Matilda. (laughs) And you guys were saying, like, he's only described by, like, his his killitude and not really, like, his stealth or any of that shit. Look, he's only described by how well he kills and nothing else because he leaves no one alive. How are people (laughs) supposed to rave about Wick's stealth and shit when everybody dead? (laughs) You're talking about how he's, like, doesn't have as good of tactics, you know, he's walking in through the front door. And I will grant you probably that Leon may have a slight edge when it comes to some of the other stuff, but it's not as big of an edge as you're making it out to be because we do see John Wick doing a lot of stealthiness. And it doesn't matter if you are like smarter than a grizzly bear, you can't beat a grizzly bear in a fight. It doesn't matter if you're smarter than a cheetah, you can't outrun a cheetah. You can be a wave and knock down sandcastles, but I can still build a levee. And the only thing I'm going to say is You do not have that much time to build a levee to stop John Wick. (laughs) That's- it's a metaphor, you piece of shit! (laughs) I am building- I am building upon your metaphor with another metaphor! (laughs) Look, dude! (laughs) Last thing I'm going to say- It's how Shakespeare did it, where someone would put forth a metaphor- I'm just going to say this. I'm just gonna say this right now. Fucking John Wick, let his dog die. Leon, he saved that plant, motherfucker. He saved it. <laughs> Shame he his couldn't best save friend's himself. alive. He could not save himself. All right, you guys are on neutral ground. No killing. <laughs> <laughs> well, needless to say, this fight has been getting just crazy. The mansion is trashed. There are an unconscionable number of dead mooks strewn throughout the hallways, and both Wick and Leon have completely gone through all of their respective ammunition and have resorted to simply trying to beat each other to a pulp with their bare hands. The struggle continues through the hallways of the mansion, lit by what few lights remain, with occasional flashes and thunderclaps from the outside. That's right. I'm predicting a 100% chance of lightning round. Ah! Yay! You said strewn and you said mooks in the same sentence. And I, I sure did. Right. In fact, I said mooks strewn. I love a strewn mook. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't I... love a nice toasted strewn mook? <laughs> the Hamburglar by this point is just cowering uselessly in the back office of the mansion, <laughs> listening to the sounds of two hardened combat experts doing everything they can to dismantle each other. The Hamburglar doesn't know who's going to emerge victorious, but whoever does will no doubt be kicking down the door and closing in on him with murderous fury in a very short space of time. The Hamburglar sets his jaw and slowly raises his cell phone to his ear. He didn't want to have to do this. Doing this means he's going to be in debt to perhaps the one person who scares him more than either Wick or Leon. But at this point, he doesn't really see what choice he has. The call goes through. No voice responds on the other end of the line, but the Hamburglar knows who is listening. Activate Code Robble, he says gravely. (laughs) And may God have mercy on my soul. (laughs) At that moment, the skylight directly above Wick and Leon's fierce melee shatters apart. A long black vacuum tube several feet wide drops down with frightening speed, and before either assassin can react, they are sucked in. Their journey is long, but fast, as the vacuum tube pulls them further and further up, past the clouds, past the atmosphere, into orbit. The two men are finally dropped into a small room made of metal, featureless except for a large set of double sliding doors, a table, and a view screen. Looking out the windows, the men appear to be on a space station of some kind, and an unusual one at that. It's shaped like a dog bone, and appears to be oh, extremely oh low budget. <laughs> Before they have a chance to either get acclimated to their new surroundings or to resume their battle, the view screen flickers to life. A sinister figure appears, wearing a brightly colored lab coat and a sinister grin. Hello, poopsies, the man says. Oh, God. (laughs) And welcome to the Satellite of Love, your new home. (laughs) My name is Nate Swanson, but I've recently discovered that my grandfather's (laughs) name was Forrester. 
Turns out being a forester, even a distant relation, comes with some pretty sweet perks, including inheriting an extensive mad science lab and a sweet satellite, with which to perform cruel and inhuman experiments upon the unsuspecting. That being the two of you, of course. I certainly hope you enjoy cheesy movies, because I have a whole stack of the worst I could find. You'll have to sit and watch them all while I monitor your minds. Ah, oh, yes, it's wonderful being evil. <laughs> Minions, get them started with some Batman and Robin. <laughs> oh, God. Show mercy, <laughs> Dr. Forrester. <laughs> so, advocates, your hitmen have now been taken prisoner aboard the Satellite of Love, forced to endure some of the worst cinematic atrocities humankind has made over the last century. The winner is no longer who is the best killer, but who can best resist the maddening influence of back-to-back -back viewings of movies like Battlefield Earth, Master of Disguise, and Birdemic. All the while, <laughs> making clever riffs for a non-existent audience. Why is your character best suited to hold back the crushing despair of their imprisonment? Why are they best suited to providing hilarious running commentary for these films? Will they use some of the satellite special parts to make some robot friends? If so, describe their robot friends. Finally, tell me one or two of these bad movies that your character enjoys, either because it's a so-bad-it's-good sort of thing, or because there's something about it your character genuinely likes. Team Leon went first in the main round, so Team John Wick will be starting us off in the lightning round. I mean, holding back despair. I mean, that's, that's all he does, isn't it? <laughs> like, his whole fucking life is murder and despair, and yet he doesn't kill himself. He's, he's a boss, <laughs> I'd say. I will say, though... Uh, I don't see him providing hilarious commentary. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's not a chatty guy, and when he does, he's, he's met his match. Yeah, yeah, that's I'm, I'm gonna give you that one. John Wick is a man of sheer fucking will. Um, he can endure any amount of like pain and torture, whether it be psychological or physical, even if it be the horrors of say, you know, space mutiny or Manos, the hands of fate. Mm -hmm. I, when it comes to being hilarious, I think he's, he's somewhat laconic. He is, he is a man of few words, but um, you know, he has, he has his, he, has, he he's going to pick his moments in the movies, but, but his one-liners when they come will be quite good. I mean, they, there's the like, you know, everything's got a price bitch to which he responded, not this bitch. So I think he's going to get like one good one per movie that's that everybody's going to just go like, Oh, that's so good. But then in between, he's just going to be kind of like, <laughs> he's going to be like half like, an hour of the movie. And then he goes, Whoa. And another half yeah. hour of the movie. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know his some of his quips may come like a minute too late to where it was like that would have been a good point like a little while ago. Um, wait, wait, wait! What rewind it, it, rewind it! I had something. Good. Yes, I have. I have a good one for that scene. We just. Um, when it comes to making robots, I think obviously he's going to make uh, robots in the likeness of his dead wife and his oh, uh, lost no. dog. No, no. <laughs> wow. I thought the wife thing was too dark, but I definitely, I definitely approve of a Roomba dog. He, yes. ta he tapes like knives and pencils and nail files too. <laughs> <laughs> the yeah, dog. and of course, um, he will ultimately get off the satellite of love uh, when Nate Swanson Forrester, uh, you know, accidentally kills his uh little robot daisy and robot wife and then he's going to of course you know i don't know throw the satellite of love at him <laughs> and then <laughs> like kick off of it and re-enter orbit and then like crash on the ground and brush himself off and be fine <laughs> i just checked i'd look for like the worst rated keanu reeves movies oh no oh, yeah <laughs> and i think it looks like uh, the day the earth stood still is at mm. the top so yeah, I think John Wick is going to cry so much when he sees the lake house. He's <laughs> like, they can't be together. They're eternally Aww. separated. All right. Very good. Team Leon. What, uh, what do you have to share for us? Dude, the, the guy is into John Wayne movies. <laughs> have you ever seen a John Wayne movie? <laughs> that shit's bad. <laughs> that shit's real bad. I apologize to anyone out there who loves John Wayne Westerns, but holy shit. That is some bad cinema. So, like, this is not even going to phase him, man. Like, it's not, it's going to, he's going to be, like, really interested, you know, but it's not going to phase him one bit. I mean, like, the movies that MST3K usually does are probably movies he's seen in the theater and enjoyed. <laughs> so that's what i was gonna know. say i don't think he's gonna know i don't yeah, think no. he's gonna get that this is a bad thing <laughs> he he's won't get it at all like, oh 
this is different from from my apartment and plant life. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So as far as clever riffs, like, okay, what he's going to say is going to be funny because it's him saying it. But, like, he's going to see stuff like, uh, I spit on your grave and go like, oh, it's funny because she has killed so many people. (laughs) Oh, it's so good. Or, like, see Theodore Rex and go, that dinosaur is wearing shoes. Oh, my God. Like, so he's got a real Howard Drax Duck sort of outlook go, on stuff is what right. he's saying. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, if singing in the rain is his idea of a good time, then I think his sensibilities are, are pretty normal, standard filmic sensibilities. I think his idea, like, anything outside of that, this is a guy who pets his plant with water to clean it. Like, anything his, outside yeah. of that is going to blow his fucking mind. He's going to see Howard the Duck and be like, <laughs> His accent obviously is going to make pretty much anything he says funny, no matter oh, what he's yes. saying. Oh my god! So like, and also I mean, that weird little face he makes. <laughs> yeah, Jean Jean Reno has like perfect deadpan. His yes, hilarious Italian accent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, like um, you see his other movies, and like Jean Reno, you know that dude is funny. Keanu Reeves, we laugh at him, but it's not because he's telling jokes. Yes. So you know. Um, I think I Spit on Your Grave probably is going to be one of his favorite films. It's going to be the one that he asked for the most because he's going to be like, oh, I'm so proud of her. She worked so hard to do this and she did such a good job. Like to him, <laughs> that's going to be like a heartfelt like hallmark. That's movie. an aspirational picture. Uh, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's like, look, she set out with a goal and she did it. That's that's the dream of America. It's why I came to this country. Um, as far as the, the robots go, I mean, there's one really obvious answer, but I'm not going to go there. Uh-huh. Um, so uh-huh. I'm just going to say that, uh, he's got a bunch of, uh, robots that, um, speak in various types of Italian accents <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> they add to the hilarity by constantly correcting him when he tries to say he's Italian. Mm-hmm. Um, uh-huh. you know, and they're shaped like various weapons. Like one of them is kind of like Guron from Gamer versus Guron, you know, with the knife head, right? You know that kind of thing. Um, one of them has like really kind of like sniper rifle eyes, like with scopes, so they can really get in there and see what's good and bad about these movies. <laughs> um, and then you know, some more of them are just generally there. There, there is one that's grenade shaped. Um, you know, don't ever pull the pin. I mean, we say that it happens at the end of every episode. It's like C Lab, you know. It's just it's, <laughs> what are you gonna do? Oh, and he has one more, and that's um, that's Kitchen Pig, and uh, Kitchen Pig is it's, it's just a pile of stuff, but uh, it, it makes him feel better. And whenever he's like, because he remembers how Kitchen Pig like made Matilda feel better after her whole family had died. So whenever he's like, oh, I didn't like this movie very much, he goes and sits next to this pile of stuff, and he goes like. I don't know, Kitchen Pig, that wasn't very good. And then he just looks at the pile of stuff, and he's like, you're right, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's been an interesting episode today. We've chased hamburger thieves, killed a bunch of faceless guards, punched each other a lot, and watched a lot of terrible movies on board a satellite created on a public access TV budget. But the time has come to declare the verdict, and with that in mind, the choice has to be Oh, wait, that flashing light means we've got deliberation sign. I'll be back. <laughs> uh, so the game designer, John Wick, by the way. Um, <laughs> damn it. Oh, yeah. No, so I got to talk to him around the time the movie was coming out because he goes to RinCon every year, which is in Tucson. And apparently he's, he was at the time, I don't know how things turned out with this, but he was working to get the rights to John Wick to make a John Wick role-playing game wow. so that it would be the John Wick role-playing game designed by John Wick. Oh, um, wow. I, would tell him, so, right, I don't that know was, how That th- was worth it. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how okay, things okay. turned out, but I do hope that that comes to fruition someday. I fucking love the professional. Oh, he was so adorable when he was watching Singing in the Rain. I really, that actor does a great <laughs> oh job God. with like that scene, his little face. Jean so, Renault, he's a great actor. Yeah, yeah, he's good. He's amazing. I was not sure how I was going to feel about that movie, but while watching it, I was like, this is really, really good acting. I think it's fantastic. John Wick, the first John Wick was really good. We, we talked a little bit before we uh, started recording about whether or not we liked the three films that we had to watch for this match. And, mm-hmm. um,. I think I would rank them like professional than John Wick than John Wick 2. Like professional and the first John Wick are close, but John Wick 2 is like 
down in the basement, dude. I thought that it was garbage. Uh, oh, I, I, I actually kind of liked it because it was just yeah. so it, stupid. It, it just it like embraced its own stupid. Yes, yeah. it definitely got cheesier than the first one. And, but and that like, one has that one has Ruby Rose. Yes, Ruby Rose. She's yeah, so, I know. That was we very love her. <laughs> She's so good. Uh, there's a possibility of a John Wick TV show, what? but the AV Club was like, eh, we'd only watch it if it was about Lance Reddick. And then I was just telling Miles, I was like, I just wanted to be Lance Reddick and uh, Ian McShane, but like on a Murder Pals trip. <laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> watch the oh, shit God, out of I that. Oh, God, I want that so much. Who's, who's Lance Reddick? Ian McShane Who was, was the best He's the, the dude at the Lance... front desk in the Continental. Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah. Great, yeah. Uh, Whenever Yen John Wick asks, like, how was the dog? And he's like, it's good. He's a good dog. Uh, <laughs> I was like, yes, he is. He's a good dog. I told Sharon They're when we were watching dogs. John Wick 2 that, because, <laughs> like, we watched John Wick, and when and, and I, I had no idea what the movie was about, because yeah. I had never seen it before. And so I was like, God damn it, that dog's going to die, isn't it? And it <laughs> That's did, what I was, and I was afraid sad. of, too. And, yeah. and then we were watching the second one, and I was like, if this fucking dog dies, um, we're turning the movie <laughs> yeah, off. Like, yeah. I will do the rest of my research on Wikipedia. Yeah. We are turning the movie off. No, nah, they, they, they couldn't do that to you twice. I know. And when they blew up the house, I was like, oh, you motherfuckers. And then the dog was there. I was like, all right. All right. Good. We're good. John Wick 2. <laughs> I, uh... I, almost, I almost gave you the Transformers treatment. <laughs> I, I wrote down in my notes that, like, John Wick must have this fucking alpha wolf aura come off of him because he you never see him train any of his dogs, but they're always, like, the most obedient fucking things ever. They just, like, perfectly, yeah. perfectly sit, like, sit still. And even when he gives them to somebody else, they're just so good. I seriously think, like, those movies, the John Wick movies are so interesting in terms of, like, the world they set up. Yeah. Yes. I'm it's, yes. like, actually not... Yes interested in the character yeah. at all. No. It's actually like it would be a, a pretty cool like RPG setting. That's what like, I was thinking. Yeah. 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 It could be like a good like gameable episode. <laughs> <laughs> like I feel like they're trying to make an American James Bond, but mm -hmm. the world is like it, ah it has all the greatest stuff about kind of that James Bond world of of money and insanity. <laughs> Like Peter Serafino says, the weapons sommelier. Yeah, that was that great. Was yes. Yes. That was the scene. But I was like, why can't we just have that? Because then it's like, oh no, this is like things. There's stakes. Things are happening. Feelings are afoot. And then you're like, but no, just go back to Peter Serafino. It's saying dumb shit. Yeah. <laughs> Bob, I know you love that scene because you told me you love that scene. That yes. was that was the scene <laughs> where I turned on the movie. I was like, fuck you, man. This is bullshit. <laughs> oh, like, no, oh, it's great. Peter Serafino is just so great. I know Miles, he is, but why can't you enjoy things? <laughs> because things are shitty. They they're, are, but, but they're that great. Was not. Like but because great. there's this movie telling me that that it thinks that Keanu Reeves saying these lines, Keanu Reeves going like. What about dessert? I think treats, you think it's more serious it like than it is. Great movie, like this great line. What? Well, I think you think it's more serious than it is. Yeah. I, no, but I, it's. I think the I think the movie thinks it's more serious than it is. No, I think yeah. it knows it's oh, cheesy. God, I think it knows I, it's stupid. I don't. Know. I don't think, I think so. The movie doesn't know how cheesy. I think John Wick Two thinks, thinks it's cool. It's mm. uh, I I will say the part of the of two that it, like. I wasn't a fan of. Thankfully, it was at the very end when, like, basically the owner of the Continental shows that, like, everybody in that plaza was an assassin. Yeah, that was, for him. that made no fucking sense. And, I, and then, you know, I, I was just like, what the fuck? So, and I turned to Dan, is this a world of assassins? <laughs> like, is no, anyone not I an guess assassin? Well, everyone that. an assassin? That makes no sense. <laughs> I'm like, am I an assassin? <laughs> oh no. The best character in the first movie gets killed because she broke the continental piece, right? Right, yeah. right. Oh yeah, she's amazing. And then in okay. the second movie, they're like, oh, if you break the continental piece, you'll be exiled. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, wait right. a minute, what happened to Murdered oh. on no, Sight? No, it's because he was buddies. He like gave him a he yeah. gave him No, like he a said at the he said at the beginning of the film the punishment for breaking the Continental Truce is excommunicado. Yeah, excommunicado. He said at the beginning. He said at the beginning, which means you die. It's, no, it's that's like, not what that it's means. It's like calling it dessert. It's it's <laughs> that's, just no, another that's way not, of saying you die. That's not the definition of excommunication. And at the end Neither of the movie, is he says, knives. <laughs> okay, but at the end of the movie, he says, "Well, now you're excommunicated." And then he actually was excommunicated. You do make a good point, Miles. I'll, I will give you that. I, I see you guys I mean, have kept up the uh, the arguing throughout my absence. Yeah. It <laughs> warms my heart to see. Catch, <laughs> you guys. This was fiery. So we have this whole thing where, you know, the judge has to be uh, unbiased when they go in. And I was unbiased for this. But going in, I wasn't sure how Miles and Bob were going to spin their argument. And 
I should not have doubted for a second that they were going to come up with a brilliant way of doing that because you guys made excellent points about how smart Leon is and how much stealthier he is and how much more strategic and calculating he is. Whereas, you know, John Wick is a very effective blunt instrument, but he is a blunt instrument. And I find that a very compelling argument because when you have this character who is essentially like almost unstoppable, the way to stop him is with intelligence and planning. You know, like that's that's why Batman has the success ratio that he does against characters that he really shouldn't. I was really stuck on whether this kind of immovable object could stop this unstoppable force. What it came down to was I had to think about what this fight would be like for each of them. John Wick never faces anyone in his movie that's as competent as Leon. He fights a lot of assassins that are really different, but I feel like Leon is better than any of them. But Leon never runs into anyone that's even close to John Wick in his movie. And I feel like I have to give it to John Wick for that reason. Oh, God. You had me scared, Dan. But, I, was, I was tightly gripping this uh-huh. pencil, and I didn't know if I was going to make a mistake today. But, like, <laughs> that... Ugh, man. Oh, you guys, you're so good. You're, <laughs> you are Thanks. so good. And it, it was. You shouldn't have crossed me, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. You won't know about it now. Uh, you'll, you'll forget that I said this later on, but you shouldn't have crossed me. I mean, it is recorded, Matt. Like, <laughs> fuck, you probably shouldn't. fuck it. Damn it. It's a fucking podcast. It's been too long. I forget things about this project. So I want to start with that. Uh... A little, little comment that David Waters left for us on uh, Patreon. He actually left it on one of your DM screens, Dan. Oh, yes. The DM screens are where Dan uh, puts up his league notes every couple weeks or so. And David Waters writes, I love these peeks behind the curtain. One of my favorite parts of the Marvel system is how quickly I've been able to stat enemies. The Zerg and Terran armies practically assemble themselves. Thanks for all the notes, Dan. Yes, for, for those of you who don't uh, follow us on Facebook, uh, David Waters is running his own league game. Yeah. Uh, presumably with his own tabletop group, which is very flattering. And uh, I'm glad that he's uh, he's enjoying the notes that I'm putting up. Yeah. It, I try to include a little bit of insight into, you know, what I was thinking when I wrote it and what my initial thought was and how things ended up going differently when I actually ran it. So, yeah, I I think it's a lot of fun. I'm, I'm having fun uh, putting them together, and I'm glad to see that, you know, it's, it's gaining traction in the minds of people who are interested in that sort of thing. Dan writes very good notes, so if you are intrigued by uh, the Marvel system, which Dan hacked into a very, very easy system to use, you should check this out. Just saying. Only costs a dollar a month. (laughs) Um, And then, over to Twitter. Thank you to Florian, Lucas Brown, the You, Me, and Duffy podcast, Cosplay Fiend, uh, Sandwich Surplus, Dr. G Nerdologist, fantastic name, Christine Robinson, (laughs) Vander Turner, the Mott You Cast, the Masters of the Universe podcast, Neil Butler and Rafael Medina for retweeting our stuff or just tweeting about us. On Tumblr, thank you to Somewhat Somewhat, By Forge and Fire, Jeep Rhyme, and Sid Rapid Blog for reblogging her stuff. And on Facebook, thank you to Evan Staves for sharing our episode. Yes. Thanks, Evan. Thanks. Uh, and thanks in particular to David Waters and Nate Swanson, who were our two featured patrons in uh, in my ridiculous narration this week. All patrons uh, of a dollar or higher will eventually be worked into our intensely complex Smash Fiction continuity in some fashion <laughs> or another. And finally, thanks to longtime fan Addison for suggesting this match. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Smash Fiction. Next week, we're going to be releasing the 18th episode of Extraordinary League, our actual play RPG podcast, for reals this time. And then the week after that, our next match will be Aslan from Chronicles of Narnia versus Amaterasu from Okami. Smash Fiction is produced by Miles Schneiderman and production assistant Sharon Holden, with logo designed by Colin Mulcairin. Special thanks to Kevin McLeod of the Clan McLeod at Incompetech.com for our theme song, Hitman. You can find us on Twitter at Smash Fic Podcast and search for the Smash Fiction Podcast on Facebook, Tumblr, and YouTube. Subscribe on iTunes or your podcatcher of choice, and if you leave us a good review, we shall become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. Smash Fiction is made possible thanks to our supporters on Patreon at patreon.com slash smashfictionpodcast. 
Please consider donating as little as a dollar each month. It helps us keep the show going. And we have great rewards and extra content for those who help us out. If you have any suggestions, feedback, or other contributions, send them to us at smashfictionpodcast at gmail.com and help us continue the fight. What movie does your character actually enjoy watching, either because it's, like, really good bad or because they actually like it? But it has to be a movie that's, like, you know, by and large regarded as bad. So, you know, they're not going to be showing Singing in the Rain on the satellite. Right, right. Terminator 2. (laughs) Shut up! (laughs) Man, I would love to be imprisoned on the satellite of love that Miles was running. Yes. Because then I'd just be like, these movies are great! (laughs) Judge, I would like to put forth that based on that comment, clearly this advocate is not fit to (laughs) be on this podcast. I'll allow it, but you're on thin ice, counselor. (laughs) Sorry, I I just always wanted to say that. (laughs) I had the word paucity in my <laughs> argument at one time, but I cut it out. Mm, paucity's a good one. Anyway. Yeah. Oh, no. I should have left it in. Oh, it's so I just so, knew you guys would make fun of me, so. So what you're saying is you had a paucity have, of paucity. But... I currently have a paucity oh! of paucity. <laughs> All right. It's been a while. I gotta, I gotta uh, gear up. Mm. I know. Stretch. I feel you. <laughs> Deltoids. <laughs> <You're fine. sighs> Quads. <sighs> Other muscle names. You use your quads to podcast? <laughs> Do you not? I use my glutes, that's for damn good. Yeah, I use every muscle. I mean, you use right. the quadcast? <laughs> the quadcast. Oh, oh, God. Get off my teeth. Ian, be on my I team like call. That. that was a good joke. No. <laughs>